Each January, Calvin University brings you a free 15-day lecture series that aims to cultivate deep thought, share rich stories, and provide an opportunity to learn and grow. Over the past two years, we've offered a virtual option and you have loved it. So we thought, do we really have to wait until January? Welcome to the January series in July. I'm Michael Wiltskit, the new director of this series, and I'm excited to learn alongside you. We'll be back to our regular programming in January of 2023, and I'm excited to share the lineup of speakers in a couple of months. I'm thankful for our underwriters whose support over the years allows us to provide this gift to our community. I'm particularly thankful to Baker Bookhouse, the Meyer Foundation, the Doug and Maria DeVos Foundation, and our daily underwriters. We couldn't do this work without your support. Today, we'll hear from Angie Schmidt on the silent epidemic of pedestrian deaths that she navigates in her recent book, Right of Way. Angie is one of the country's best known writers on the topic of sustainable transportation. Her writing and commentary have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and NPR. She is the founder of 3MPH Planning and Consulting, a small Cleveland-based firm which is focused on pedestrian safety. Following Angie's talk, Professor Karen Tape will join in a short question and answer segment. Welcome, Angie, to the January series in July. Thanks so much for the nice introduction, Michael. I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Angie Schmidt again, and um, I'm the author of this book, Right of Way. It was published in 2020 by Island Press. And when I give sort of my um, elevator pitch about what it's about, I say it's about the pedestrian safety crisis in the US. Um, so in this presentation, um, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Uh, just to give a, a little bit of an overview, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the problem. I'm going to talk about what I mean when I say the pedestrian safety crisis, and then, then I'm going to talk a, a little bit about who is getting killed because it, it has a strong um, demographic component. Then I'll talk a little bit about where it's happening. Um, it has a strong geographic component as well, and that can help sort of explain what's happening. And then I like to warn people right at the beginning, there's a, there's a section in the middle that's all about cars. We're going to geek out a little bit about cars. Um, and consumer trends, because that's a big part of the explanation as well. And then at the end, we'll talk about solutions, everyone's favorite part. So I'm um, gonna start off talking, like I said, a little bit about the history. And this is a photo taken in 1930 in Cleveland. And this, this shows, that's where I live. Um, I'm just gonna use Cleveland a couple times as an example. Um, so this shows Euclid Avenue, which is sort of our downtown Main Street in Cleveland. Again, in 1930, and you can see there's already some cars sort of on the scene at this at this stage. You're parked on the side of the road, but it's still heavily pedestrianized city. We got the, the streetcars. A lot of people are using those to get around every day. Um, and there, there's a couple things I just wanted to point out about this picture. One being um, obviously the volume of pedestrians, but also I, I just want to point out sort of how relaxed they look. Um, at this point in our history, there were no crosswalks. The concept of jaywalking did not occur. Pedestrians had sort of free roam over the streets. They were treated like a public space. So, um, they, so this is um, this is a, just an example. Uh, they a lot of varied social activities would take place in the street. Uh, this you know photo shows children playing. It was very common. Um, people, merchants would sell goods from carts in the street. Neighbors would pause and greet each other. So streets were social places until around this period. And then we enter the auto era in the United States around this period. Um, so uh, going ahead, so over a short time, so this is Cleveland, a picture of Cleveland. Now this is a different street, but it's also a downtown street. This is 16 years later. So I think a lot of people don't realize how sort of quickly things changed and how transformative a change it was over a short period, the early auto era in the United States is what we're talking about now. And um, there, there was a big shift in um, a big shift in how we think of streets. What are streets for? So prior to this era, like I said, um, you know, they were sort of a, they were another public space in the city. And in, in many cities, they take up 10, 20, 30% of our city is occupied by streets, street right-of-ways, parking lots. So this is a, this is a lot of land. 
But um, in this period, uh, when cars start, the Model T Ford is introduced, um, cars start really entering cities in a big way. And um, there's, there's a guy named Peter Norton at the University of Virginia that wrote, wrote a really interesting book about this. It's called Fighting Traffic. He explains that there was actually a lot of political outcry and resistance to this. Because as soon as cars started coming into cities in a big way, people started getting killed in really high volumes. So um, cities like Philadelphia start having thousands of um, traffic deaths a year, and disproportionately, they were children. So a lot of moms organized. Uh, he goes into a lot of detail about it in his book. Mothers of ch uh, who had lost children to these kind of crashes started organizing, and they were trying to limit sort of the domain of cars and cities. And in Cincinnati, they had proposed requiring them to be speed limited around 25 miles per hour, I think. So in, in, in response, there was um, sort of a counter organ organization by groups representing the auto industry. It included fuel sellers, um, car dealers, auto enthusiast groups, and they sort of got counter organized to represent their own interests. And one thing that they introduced that he talks about a lot that's really important in how we frame this is they introduced this concept of jaywalking. And this was totally new at the time, the idea that pedestrians didn't have a right to be in the road. And even when they did, they only had this limited space and only when sort of traffic wasn't present, when the light allowed it. So they were, obviously they were successful in implementing that sort of framework and it really changed the way we think about what streets are for and who belongs in the streets. And I, I think as a result, when a pedestrian is killed now, there's there's sort of a tendency to knee-jerk blame the pedestrian. Well, why were they in the road? Whereas prior to this era, um, and again, Peter Norton writes a lot about this in his book, um, when children, for example, if a child or a pedestrian was killed, they the um, sort of instinct was to blame the driver. A lot of the newspaper headlines were calling um, drivers that were involved in fatal collisions murderers, for example. So the, there's a real reframing that takes place in this era that, uh, it's starting to change, but hasn't changed a lot to this day. Okay, so that's a little bit about the history. Now I'm going to talk about what I mean by the pedestrian safety crisis. So uh, over about the past decade, we've seen about a 50% increase in pedestrian deaths. And that is really unprecedented. So um, you, normally in traffic safety, we sort of expect the trend over time, at least since the 1970s, since sort of the Ralph Nader era, since we started introducing seatbelts, is that gradually the number of deaths would decline, that things would get better. But over the past 10 years, we saw this, this counter trend with pedestrian deaths. And it was so unusual that as it started to occur, um, a lot of experts sort of thought it was a fluke or an anomaly, but we now know it's a sustained trend. And um, this, this, this graph is a little out of date, um, but one thing I want to point out is it's, it's actually gotten worse during the pandemic. So even when driving miles declined during the pandemic because a lot of people were staying home and telecommuting, um, the number of pedestrian deaths actually shot up dramatically. Um, Okay, so that's what this shows. That's what this graph shows. So 2020, we're seeing another big increase. Okay, so a little bit now about who is getting killed. Because again, like I said, um, there's some clear patterns here and it can help sort of explain what's happening. So I think that there was a little bit of a stereotype um, a, among sort of media folks or traffic safety officials about who is getting killed and in their minds when they think about the problem, they think of this guy sort of here on the left. And he's like a very m wired millennial. He's crossing at a crosswalk. Um, maybe he's distracted by his phone. And I think um, it's, it's, in, it's inaccurate and it's harmful. And I think it comes from a lot of people who are in positions of authority in the media and government are a little bit privileged. Maybe they drive cars to work. And this is the kind of thing that they encounter anecdotally, right? They see a guy in a crosswalk using a phone and that sort of annoys them. But that doesn't mean that's a good sort of snapshot of really what the problem is and who's getting killed. So really it's much more, the kind of people who are getting killed are much more like this guy here on the right that's just kind of sprinting across this really wide suburban arterial that in this case doesn't even have a crosswalk. And maybe maybe this is a lower income person 
Um, and so I think um, a lot of people, again, a lot of the more influential people in this realm um, are a little bit more privileged or in our society, and they, they can't relate, sort of. They, they're not put in the position that this guy is here on the right, where they're sort of having this sprint across a suburban arterial to catch a bus, and so um, they're not very sympathetic. Okay, so again, this is, I think, you know, in public health overall, and you know, corona is a good example, we're starting to understand how um, institutional racism plays into a lot of our public health problems. And, and this is very similar. Um, so black people, native people are at increased risk to be killed while walking. Um, native people in this graph, almost twice as likely, and um, black people about 75% more likely. Some Sometimes um, we do see um, data that shows increased risk for Hispanic folks as well. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk more in the presentation about why that is. Um, but there, there's other groups, pretty much any, any, um, demographic group that's a little bit marginalized, um, or oppressed is more likely to be killed this way, um, while walking. An another group I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about is older folks, um, are at increased risk. Uh, as the risk starts rising when they're as young as 50 and the time, by the time that they're, um, 75 and above, um, they're more than 50% more likely to be killed. So um, so one, one point I want to make about this is that, A, this is not a demographic group we've been doing a very good job planning for. A lot of our sort of norms, our institutional norms in traffic safety, for example, the way we time the walk signal at crosswalks are um, designed with sort of a fit middle-aged person in mind. And so they're a little bit discriminatory against people who are slower moving. Um, and in addition, uh, another point real quickly, this is a really fast growing demographic in the United States. So we're up to almost one in four people being 65 and above. And over the next few decades, it's supposed to rise to one in three. So um, there's actually groups like the CDC that predicted as much as 10 years ago that pedestrian fatalities would rise just because of the aging of the population. So I do think that's a factor. The population, one factor that can explain the rise in pedestrian deaths, and it's not the total explanation, but one factor is the population is aging and so is a little bit more vulnerable. Okay, another, just real quickly, I don't think this probably won't surprise anyone, but there's a lot of data showing that um, low-income neighborhoods, people in low-income neighborhoods are at higher risk. And um, there's a couple things going on there. A, low-income neighborhoods are often passed over for the kind of safety amenities that wealthier neighborhoods are able to um, secure, like a little good street lighting, crosswalks, sidewalks. Um, and in addition, you know, lower income people may be more likely to rely on walking, biking, or the bus. Okay, so that's a little bit about who's getting killed. Now I'm going to shift and talk about where. So, because um, again, there's, there's, we can, we notice these patterns when we look at this, um, and that they can help explain sort of what's happening. So, um, Smart Growth America does this nice, nice report every two years looking at this problem, and. They, they produce a list of the most dangerous cities and the most dangerous states every year. And I think you can see really clearly, this is this shows the most dangerous places for pedestrians. There's this very clear pattern where um, the most dangerous cities are in the South and particularly the Southeast and particularly Florida. Florida is always like, um, they'll do like the top 10. You notice the, the top 10 right here. So eight out of 10 or a seven out of 10 of the most dangerous cities are in Florida. So, so why is that the case? Um, you know, when I'm in there in person with people, sometimes I ask them to guess. And sometimes they might guess, well, it's warmer in those places, so people walk more. But the, the real explanation is, um, if you think back to the, uh, the first few slides I showed that showed Cleveland at the, in the early auto era. So a lot of older cities, sort of like in the Midwest, or the Northeast were pretty well developed before the auto era began in the United States. Cleveland is a perfect example. Our sort of population height was around that era, was around 1920. So our streets and our neighborhoods were sort of designed with pedestrians in mind. 
Um, that's not the case at all for Florida. Florida had barely a million people in 1940 and now has almost 20 million people. So almost all the growth in these um, Sunbelt cities has occurred during the auto era in the United States, where the norm was to build these wide arterial streets that are very dangerous. A lot of engineers from this period were really influenced by the um, building of the interstate highway system. And a lot of that carried over into designing sort of dangerous streets. So these cities are very hostile to people on foot as a result. This is sort of a legacy of their history. Um, and as a result, they um, have much higher pedestrian fatality rates. Okay, so that's sort of the national pattern. Oh, uh, another, th another point I want to make about this before I move on is, again, when we look at demographic trends in the United States, these places that are the most dangerous for pedestrians are almost without exception the fastest growing cities in the United States. Cities like Houston, cities like Orlando, Atlanta, they're, um, they're generating much of the population growth that's happening in the United States. So that's so we have uh, Americans getting a little bit older is one factor. We also have Americans increasingly living in Sunbelt cities that are really hostile to pedestrians. So there's also some demographic changes that are taking place at the metro level that I want to talk about. And um, this is this example I'm using here. And a lot of these examples that I use that are specific metro areas, um, this is generalizable. So uh, I'm using as Atlanta as an example, but we see these kind of patterns in metro areas across the United States. So if we look at, this is um, a racial dot map of the Atlanta and its northern suburbs in 1990. Um, and the uh, orange areas show pretty homogenous white neighborhoods, and the green areas show segregated black neighborhoods, and the yellow areas show um, areas that are a little more diverse. This is back in 1990. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of historic reason why Atlanta has this kind of segregation, but um, one important thing to know is that these northern suburbs were settled a lot by white flight that took place, you know, following school desegregation efforts in Atlanta. And, um, you know, they were they were designed to be suburban places where there wasn't a lot of thought put into whether they were walkable. They have very limited transit access. Um, so I think the idea when these were originally settled and it happened prior to 1990 um, was that they would be the kind of places that these middle-class families would live and they'd have two-car garages and they'd drive everywhere. But there's been, and I don't have the most recent demographic data, unfortunately, because it would be really interesting to see, but if you look over the last few decades, there's been this massive demographic shift in the Northern Atlanta suburbs. They're much more diverse now. If you look forward to 2010, um, you can see this, this is much more diverse. There's been a massive demographic change. The suburbs are becoming more diverse. Um, that, and again, that's a national trend, but it's especially, it's especially prevalent in Atlanta because they, they're a high population growth area. So uh, in the Northern suburbs of Atlanta, there's two, there's two counties, Gwinnett and Cobb County. Um, so each of those counties now has about a million residents. So they're, they're huge population centers. They're, they're urban places now, but they're very suburban in their design. And um, now there, there's been this big, big demographic change. Um, they're both either majority, minority, or close to it. Um, and uh, there, so there's been racial change in the suburbs, but there's also been um, economic change. We, we hear about this trend a little bit called the suburbanization of poverty, but I think we really underestimate how big of a shift that is in the United States. A lot of people, I think that the the historic pattern was, oh, if you were sort of a lower income person, you when you moved to Atlanta, you you would be in the central city. That's really not the case anymore. A lot of people who are maybe recent immigrants are moving to Atlanta, and their first stop is in these northern suburbs. And you can see the Hispanic population over here on the right side of the map has really grown along this one corridor, the Beaufort Highway corridor north of Atlanta, which is um, the most, Beaufort Highway is the most dangerous road in the state of Georgia. And it, so they have this road that was designed for sort of a rural environment 
with no sidewalks. Some portions do have sidewalks, but some don't. It's very wide. It's six or seven lanes, very high traffic. And all these um, recent immigrants are, that are coming from places with lower car ownership rates are living there and trying to work there and get around and relying on a very um, widely ridden bus route that goes right along that road. So point being, the suburbs have changed a lot, but the, the, the infrastructure hasn't. The infrastructure doesn't reflect it, and, and, and that's dangerous. Okay, sh so shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk, uh, again, I'm using Cleveland as an example here, but this is... Um, this is generalizable to the wider population, so um, or to other metro areas. So you can see, sort of here again. This is a racial dot map showing segregation in Cleveland. We're a very segregated city. Um, this is 2010, but um, so if you look at sort of our neighborhoods of color, black neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods, more diverse neighborhoods, and then you compare it to the most dangerous road segments in Cleveland, I just want to point out how closely they overlap. It's almost an exact match. And um, again, we see that in city after city, very common. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. this using an example here, using the example of Portland. So, um, you know, Portland is a city I think we, we all think of fairly um, as um, a city that's done a lot to try to be pedestrian and bike friendly. Um, but we still see, even in, even in Portland, when they're, where they've been very focused on these kind of issues, we still see this really stark demographic inequality when it comes to street safety. So um, the Portland Bureau of Transportation produced these ni this nice map you see here on the left um, a few years ago, and it shows all the traffic fatalities that took place in the city of Portland over a two-year period. And they use the first names of the victims, which I think is really nice to try and humanize sort of the issue. But you can see that... Um, these deaths aren't happening in a random pattern. There's this clear concentration over here on the right side of the map. So what's sort of going on there? So if we look over to this other map, this is a map of their high crash network. And um, one thing that's important to understand about Portland is they have a big demographic dividing line right here uh, on 82nd Street, East 82nd Street. So everything east of 82nd Street in Portland is called East Portland. And for the purposes of this presentation, the important thing to know about East Portland is that it's poorer and more diverse than the rest of the city. So um, I, I think this graph really helps show sort of this in infrastructure inequality issue that I touched on earlier. So here in this map, they're showing the top 30 highest crash intersections. Out of um, the top 30, 28 out of 30 in Portland are in East Portland. So only a quarter of the population of Portland lives in East Portland, but they are twice as likely to be killed in traffic than the um, people that live in other parts of the city. So um, they account for about 50% of traffic deaths. Okay, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about infrastructure inequality, this issue of infrastructure inequality, how it relates to institutional racism. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Native Americans are at um, extremely high risk to be killed while walking. And, and there's there's probably a lot of com com complicated reasons for that, um, I should say right off the bat. But w one of the reasons seems to be that um, reservations and tribal lands, um, A, are underinvested, B, function a little bit uh, like urban areas or traditional villages where there's a good amount of walking. So th this is a photo that shows um, a tribal area in Minnesota. And um, on one side of this road, this is a state highway in Minnesota. Um, on one side of this road is a tribal service center. And on the other side is a, a food cellar. So you can see residents, um, residents here are doing a lot of walking. They, they've worn these paths in the grass, but they're having to contend with this rural infrastructure that makes almost no accommodation for pedestrians. They, they, there's no sidewalk, there's no crosswalk, there's no traffic light. They just sort of have to run across a rural highway. Um, so there, there's a group at um, the University of Minnesota that did a really interesting study about this. And um, they went out to the um, tribal lands and reservations in Minnesota, and they asked the residents, um, what are your top transportation concerns? They talked to the tribal elders, they talked to visitors, and they um, one of the top concerns that was coming up over and over again was pedestrian safety. 
Um, but, but meanwhile, there seemed to be a real disconnect between what people who lived there, the people in the communities sort of knew and understood and what was understood by the officials charged with safety. So they also interviewed, um, the folks at the DOT, the Department of Transportation for the state. And, uh, you know, those are engineers primarily. And they almost never, when they were interviewed, they almost never brought up pedestrian safety. And even when they were pressed about it, they sort of defaulted to behavioral explanations for the problem, like drunk walking. So the point, the point that I think we can take away from that, from this research, which is really good and really detailed, is that there was a disconnect and that um, on the part of the officials in charge of transportation, A, they're, um, they're probably not um, representative enough of the communities that they're serving and the communities that have the biggest issues with pedestrian safety, and B, there's not enough sometimes respect for local knowledge. Um, so, so that's just an example of how sort of institutional racism or um, our institutions can sort of fail communities that are most vulnerable. Okay, oops. So just to review a little bit, because I, like I mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about cars next, but um, like I mentioned, we, we have this big increase in pedestrian deaths. Um, so why is that happening? Well, one reason is the population is getting a little bit older. So we're a little bit more vulnerable to being hit and killed this way in the first place. So secondly, we're living in more dangerous places. We're more likely to live in the Southeast that it is really hostile to pedestrians and we're more likely to be out in, um, we're more likely to have lower income folks out in suburban areas that really weren't designed with pedestrian safety in mind. And then thirdly, we have this, and this is the factor that is, we can point to most clearly and say, this is what's causing an increase. So this is the third factor is we have this big increase, we have this big shift in our vehicle mix over the past 10 years. So um, if you look back to around um, when we're coming out of the last recession, a majority, like 2010, a majority of um, vehicles being sold were sedans, were Honda Civics, Honda Accords, um, regular cars. But, but then we see this big shift in the middle part of the last decade and um, SUVs and light trucks surpass um, sedan sales and sedan sales really taper off. This is a trend that has accelerated or gotten worse. Now, um, almost three in four new cars being sold in the United States are pickup trucks and SUVs um, and passenger cars. A lot of the, especially the um, big three American auto makers are really divested from passenger cars. Some of them, I think like Chrysler's pretty much got out of the, um, passenger car business. So now light trucks are in, in, in vogue. That's the trend in the auto industry. And it, it, it shifted very quickly. So I, I think like um, researchers who study this kind of thing were sort of caught off guard when, when this occurred and it started to produce this kind of impact. But so why does that impact pedestrian safety? So here I'm using myself. I'm about, I'm a woman who's about five, six. So I'm, I'm like an average to tall woman, um, not super tall. So you can see if I was hit by this Honda Civic here on the left, it would hit me sort of in the knees and the legs, which is not fun. It's never going to be good to be hit by a car. But if you, if you look over to this car on the right, which this is much more, this is a, um, Toyota 4Runner this is much more becoming the norm kind of car. We've shifted from this car on the left being the norm to the car, the, this car on the right being a little bit more like the norm, a much bigger car. And so you see it also, not only is it bigger and heavier, but it would hit me higher on the body. So uh, I'm being struck you know, in the, in the abdomen, in the stomach, in the chest. So that, that's a very, that's a much more dangerous place to suffer a, a really sharp blow. I mean, that's where your internal organs are, right? And um, if you're a shorter person or a child or someone in a wheelchair, you run the risk of being pushed under the wheels and run over. Whereas um, with this Honda Civic here on the right, the pattern would be that you fall forward onto the sometimes the windshield, and the windshield is designed to 
shatter in a way that cushions the blow. So, so um, there's some really good data. Um, the Federal Highway Administration did a review of the research about this in 2015, and they found that pedestrians hit by SUVs were two and a half to three times more likely to be killed, and that for child pedestrians, the, the, the risk was quadruple, the, the fatality risk. So I just want to walk you through, because like I said, I think this happened, it happened kind of slow then fast, and it, it, it became sort of invisible the way it happened. But the, the way cars have evolved has really shifted. Um, and I think it has to do with some of the, the wider like dysfunctions in our culture that we're seeing pop up. Um, but that's just an aside. So I just want to walk you through sort of the um, evolution of a single car because I think it's kind of interesting. So if we look back to 1996, this is a RAV4, and this was sort of like the original crossover SUV. And you can see how little and cute it was. They had this two-door version. Um, it's basically, and one thing also to notice is how friendly sort of the, the, the face is. Um, it's not des designed to look intimidating. It, and basically the RAV4 was um, a Corolla, a sort of a tall Corolla. Um, <clears throat> now, if we if we go forward to 2019, well, a couple things I would just want to point out. It's much heavier, almost a thousand pounds heavier at the light end, and um, higher riding, and it has this much more intimidating face. Um, the this 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 sort of prominent grill that's and the, these headlights that sort of scowl at you that's that's really the style now and some um, especially pickup truck makers have taken that to like a, a pretty extreme degree. So um, <clears throat> this is a photo I use in all my presentations and it shows my son when he was four years old sitting in front of this is a lifted Ford F two fifty. So you can see not only. Um, you know, we have this really exaggerated, aggressive looking grill. Um, and by the way, the Ford F series is the number one selling vehicle in the United States. Um, but they, they present these visibility problems also at close range. Um, so you can see, so you can see um, there's, a, there's a group called kidsandcars.org that's done some really interesting research about this. But a lot of the most popular widely selling vehicles in the United States have really enormous front blind zones um, that can be dangerous to children. So this is an experiment using a GMC SUV. They were able to place um, more than a dozen kids in the front and blind zone of a lot of the most popular vehicles in the United States. And they're totally, all these children are totally invisible to uh, a, a woman driver of average height sitting in the front of this vehicle. So the, so these larger vehicles do have these sort of visibility safety issues as well. Um, and we see it most commonly with um, reverse style accidents. So you would be surprised how often um, children are struck in their own driveways in the United States. It, it was happening, according to this group, kidsandcars.org, about 50 children every week in the United States are backed over in their own driveways, mostly by parents and um, or close friends, so a, a close relative or friend. Um, and then because of the increasing height and mass of vehicles and these really aggressive grills, we also see much more um, what we call a front over collision where um, a child is being hit at a slow speed um, that's standing directly in front of the vehicle. So, so they have they they have um, some safety limitations that present risks, especially for children. Okay. In addition, um, this is another thing that I think is is you know it came on slow and then fast, and now we take it for granted. But uh, cars are also much more powerful than they used to be. Um, they call sometimes this is called. Um, people will refer to this as the horsepower arms race. So um, it used to be a lot of cars had, the, you know, in the 80s, you know, when I was a baby, um, a lot of cars had less than 100 horsepower. They just weren't very powerful, right? And it was very rare for cars to have more than 200 horsepower. Whereas now it's very rare or it's it's becoming pretty rare for them to have under 200 horsepower. And we see cars, it's not unusual in the 300, 400 above range, okay? So um, I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but one thing to understand is um, 
cars are can drive faster. They're more powerful. So um, speed is very critical um, to pedestrian survival odds. And the cars are faster and more powerful than they used to be. So they present a bigger danger. Okay. So again, I'm going to shift gears and start talking about solutions. I know all of this is kind of a bummer and very sad, but I'm going to start talking about um, how we can resolve this. But just to review a little bit, again, we, we've had this big increase in the pedestrian deaths in the, in, um, over the last decade or so in the United States. It's a problem that's getting worse since the pandemic. Um, and you know, some of the causes are demographic shifts. The population is aging. The population is more likely to live in suburban areas or the Southeast where street conditions are very dangerous. And in addition, cars are getting bigger, they're getting heavier, and they're getting more powerful. So they're more dangerous um, to pedestrians when they're struck. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about solutions here. And I think like a lot of times when I do this presentation, a lot of people, you know, they'll ask a question and they sort of want like a silver bullet solution, right? Like, well, we, we, we spent a half hour or whatever, an hour talking about pedestrian safety. So what is sort of the solution? And I think like there's um, a desire for sort of like um, a design solution that can fix everything. But I, I think it's a little bit more complex than that, unfortunately. it's um, And one of the things that's really needed is... Um, sort of a consciousness raising about the problem. And that, that was one of my goals with the book and with doing these kind of presentations is, um, uh, you know, the, the stories we sort of tell ourselves about this are part of the issue. Is it, is, it, um, is it a matter of pedestrians just being stupid and irresponsible and not crossing at the right places? Well, if we tell ourselves that we're never going to solve it. But if we look at these, um, if we look at, the systemic problem and the patterns that present themselves, you can see um, that there, there's these wider causes that go beyond sort of individual behavior. So this is a woman I talk about a lot in my book. Her name is Amy Cohen. And the point I wanted to make here just real quickly is that there's a need for some sort of activism around this. And she's sort of, the, the, Amy Cohen is this really heroic, in my opinion, activist. She's holding a photo here. She's based in New York City of her son, um, who, whose name was Sammy, who was killed when he was 12 years old, um, trying to cross the street near their home in Brooklyn. Um, and she, uh, she has been organizing in New York City, other families, these other women, like this woman here on the right with the blonde hair, her husband was killed while biking in New York City. She's been organizing these families who, who have lost loved, loved ones to traffic collisions, and they're fighting for um, sort of collective solutions, like they 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 fought for lowering the um, default speed limit in New York City. It was 30 miles per hour before they came on the scene. Now it's 25. Um, another thing they fought for really hard is um, speed cameras in school zones, something that's been shown to be really effective um, at reducing speeding. And um, there there there's been some setbacks in in their struggle, but in 2018. New York City had the lowest number of traffic deaths in 100 years, basically since um, since cars, since the advent of the auto era in the United States. And, and they're pursuing, pursuing a policy there called Vision Zero, um, which is something that was pioneered in Sweden and now has um, gained wider acceptance. Um, acceptance internationally. And a lot of U.S. cities now have a vision zero policy where their, their goal is to eliminate traffic fatalities entirely over the long term. So the idea is no longer accepting traffic deaths as sort of the cost of doing business, but saying these are unacceptable and we can design our cities and our policies, we can design them out of, out of the system. Okay, so um, another thing that's really needed is some institutional reforms. And um, after I finished my book, I, I started, um, I have a, a small planning firm and we've been working on um, some of the things I've been involved with our campaigns to reform these measures. But um, in the United States, something I talk about in the book is we have um, an engineering manual that's very influential called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Controls Devices. And it's sort of a recipe book for our streets. And it tells engineers sort of, for example, 
um, just to relate it back to this slide, it tells engineers that this crosswalk here on the left, a brick crosswalk would be okay, but this crosswalk here on the right, a rainbow crosswalk isn't allowed. Um, and it has all sorts of sort of arbitrary rules in it. One of them that I highlight in the book and that I think is the best example of sort of how injustice gets kind of baked into our institutional norms is um, the, the MUTCD has a rule about when you can install a crosswalk with a traffic signal. So we know that to get pedestrians, we require pe pedestrians to use crosswalks to cross the street in most cases. And sometimes we even throw people in jail. People get arrested for jaywalking. But we have this secret, we have this secret book that pretty much only traffic engineers know about called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it says that traffic engineers are not supposed to add a crosswalk with a traffic signal unless 93 pedestrians per hour are crossing at that location. So that that's a very high volume for most places in the United States, especially when a safe crossing hasn't been provided. And it says failing that, you can install a crosswalk if five pedestrians have been struck in the past year. So people will go all the time to their, their city government and say, you know, my kid goes to school here. Here's a location where we need a crosswalk. And they'll be told no, that the, the engineers will go back to this book and say no, um, it's not warranted. And so they refuse that kind of infrastructure. So the good news is right now that manual, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices is undergoing revision by USDOT. And I think the Buttigieg administration at USDOT is motivated to reform that. Um, I was part of a campaign, again, with my business where we really, um, we, we were trying to draw a lot of public comments and a lot of attention to the problem. And so I'm hopeful that we will see changes to that book that will lead to safer street conditions sort of universally across the country. And the good thing about um, revising this manual is um, it doesn't require really any money. It's just when we rebuild streets, when they get, you know, maintained, there's a different set of rules in place that's a little bit fairer to pedestrians that emphasizes pedestrian safety a little bit more and the speed of drivers a little bit less. Because right now that's really what's em in, um, emphasized is getting drivers places quickly, not whether an older pedestrian can make it across the street in time. Um, okay, so another thing I want to talk about a little bit, and I think has been an overlooked issue, but it's very important, is street lighting. Because um, about 75% of pedestrian deaths in the United States happen at night. So here's an example um, if I was there in person, I'd ask sort of someone to guess which cities these are, if they could identify these cities. But since we're not, um, up here at the top, this is a picture of Detroit up here at the top. And then there's Cleveland down where I live at the bottom. And this is a picture taken from space. So you can see in this image how Detroit is a much bluer color than Cleveland. Cleveland's a much oranger color. So this is actually a big success story that I like to talk about. Um, so uh, Detroit, you know, was emerging from bankruptcy over the last decade, and um, they did they did a review of their street lights, and they found out that um, about forty percent weren't functioning for some reason. They were broken. They uh, for some reason they weren't working. So you can see Detroit was having about 47 pedestrian deaths a year in 2013. And the street lighting improvement projects, they issue bonds and they decide we're going to get all our street lights working and we're going to convert them to LED. So that's why in the previous slide, Detroit looked bluer than Cleveland. They had done that LED lighting upgrade. So this project happens between 2014 and 2016. And um, the these, these, um, these bar graphs, what they show, this blue here at the top shows pedestrians killed in dark, unlighted conditions. So you can see that before this project takes place, they're having more than 25 pedestrian deaths a year are happening in dark, unlighted conditions. And you can see even before the project is complete, they start to decline. And um, when it's complete, those are almost eliminated. They go from having 26 of those a year to just about one. So um, point being, 
street lighting is an underappreciated and important thing. And I think, again, it comes back a little bit to this issue of, I think a lot of people in positions of authority are, are a little bit privileged, their perspective on this. And so they, they may be able to just take for granted that streetlights in their neighborhood will function, but that's not the case for everyone. And, and some of these lower income neighborhoods where people are most at risk, um, the streetlights need attention. Okay, um, there, there's also a lot, there's a lot of fun, there really are a lot of fun, um, innovative interventions. A lot of cities are toying around with right now, um, including like the New York's, DC. This is a photo I took in DC and this shows a, what we call a bump out. So basically they just use some paint here. You can, and in this case, they added a little bit of color, turned it into a little bit of an art installation and just some bollards. So this is a very inexpensive treatment, but what it does is it forces drivers, a bump out like this, it forces drivers to take this turn a little more slowly because um, they, they can't, they have to take it at a sharper angle. And um, also it gives pedestrians this additional space right here that they, they have this additional protected space they can walk out into a little bit into the intersection be a little more visible have a shorter crossing distance so again very inexpensive treatment just um t finding places to uh sort of um reclaim a little bit of excess asphalt can um can be done inexpensively and can produce safety benefits another thing i want to talk about um is traffic signals a little bit, intersections. A lot of, um, one of the most dangerous um, maneuvers for, for pedestrians and also for drivers is left turns. And um, something that New York has done with a lot of success is called this center line hardening. And this is a really inexpensive treatment. Basically they put this low bump here and some raised bollards. And again, it's about um, forcing drivers to take a slower, um, sharper angled turn where a pedestrian might be more visible. And in New York City, they've also accompanied this with um, something called a pedestrian leading interval. And that means they retime the traffic signal. So pedestrians get the walk signal a few, a few seconds before turning cars get their sort of signal to go. And um, the idea is that pedestrians will have a few seconds head start. They'll be out in the middle of the intersection a little bit when cars start making those kind of dangerous left turns. And in addition, right turns can be dangerous. Um, uh, anyway, the combination of these two treatments, and again, they're very inexpensive treatments. New York City was doing this at thousands of intersections around the city for the cost of just $1,200. So adding these center line hardening treatments, which again, are just like bollards, and this is sort of like a speed bump, and then retiming the traffic signals. Um, and they were producing a 35 to 40% reduction, um, at least according to New York's data in pedestrian crashes. So it doesn't always have to be expensive and dramatic. Okay, so I like to wrap up with, oh, I, I have a few more slides, but one thing I like to sort of start concluding with is, um, this is New York City, don't be distracted by that though. When, this is a really simple sort of treatment that I like. Um, it's called a pedestrian refuge island. And it's it, this is not a real, this isn't a real new or sexy treatment. Um, the Federal Highway, administration recommends these. They say they reduce pedestrian um, crashes about 35 to 40%. They can be installed inextensively for just a few thousand dollars. Um, so we, we sort of don't lack the tools is one of my points here. We, we sort of don't lack the treatments and we, we don't really even lack the money. What we've really sort of lacked is the will and the vision to um, to resolve this problem. And again, I think it goes back to a lot of the people in positions of authority are sort of not the ones being put in these dangerous situations and may not even notice it if, you know, if when you're racing past it in the car. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the infrastructure bill just real quickly as I'm wrapping up because, um, you know, what it, it's relevant. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the story of the infrastructure bill is, the, you know, we're going to have this increased infrastructure spending. And we do have a, a new administration that I mentioned, I think, is really attuned to these safety and sustainability issues. Um, however, the infrastructure bill is not going to fix this on its own. It's it's a little bit 
there, there is some progress in the infrastructure bill, but there's also a lot of status quo. It might lead to a lot of road, suburban road widenings that could create additional dangerous conditions. Um, but it, within it, there is, um, you see there, there's a small portion that's just for safety. So they, they set aside, I believe it's about $5 billion for safety projects. But another thing is there's there's a good portion of it. This is an opportunity if anyone's from a city government or is just a normal person that wants to get involved in pressuring their city government to address this. Um, they are, uh, with the infrastructure bill, one thing they, do, they did do is um, carve out a big portion of it as competitive federal grants that uh, localities can apply for. So there is a big pool of money out there now um, that the cities and states, it takes a little bit of doing, but are able to compete for. for us. So if you have like an idea for a bold project in your city, um, it might be a good candidate for that additional federal funding. And, and that's sort of an opportunity. Um, so, so yeah, with that, I, I'm gonna um, quit sharing my screen, but um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to this. Thank you, Angie. Uh, I'm Karen Salpi and eager to ask you some questions. I will say I think I owe my life to some pedestrian safety islands in New York City a few years ago, so I'm in favor of those. Um, really? I, I want to ask first if some responsibility falls too on pedestrians to be more cautious. Um, I see people walking on the right side of the road, walking on the left, lets you see who's coming and so forth. Um, what about what about a law against texting and walking? What about requiring pedestrians to um, to practice safety habits? Or is that is that only a small part of the problem? I mean, that's sort of what we've been doing, and it's just not very effective. Um, like, I, I've actually been involved um, with some efforts to try and decriminalize jaywalking because um, if you look at like jaywalking enforcement in the United States, it almost always becomes it's almost always racially biased, right? Um, it becomes like cops a lot of times going out, at, and we have all this data in Chicago, in Seattle. Um, it almost always becomes just sort of a pretext to stop lower status people and, and that higher status people are, are sort of able to get away and, and, and get away with it. And sometimes, I mean, pedestrians do already have a very strong incentive not to get hit by a car, right? They don't want to die. <laughs> so uh, the, the idea, and a lot of, one of the points people are making when I talk to them about this jaywalking decriminalization stuff is that, um, you know, a misdemeanor ticket is not a stronger incentive not to cross mid-block than not getting killed, right? So I, I, don't, I think we should give pedestrians more credit for having sort of um, behaving rationally, but they're in a very hostile environment. I mean, it, if you've ever done any amount of walking, it's, it can be really sort of infuriating what you encounter. And um, another thing is the yielding rate for drivers is horrible. Like if we look at yielding rates, um, drivers are supposed to be yielding to pedestrians. I don't think they understand that in a lot of cases. across Not just at crosswalks, but actually every intersection is supposed to be an unmarked crosswalk. So the corner of every intersection is considered a crosswalk technically. Whether or not it's marked. Places. Right, yeah. whether or not it's marked. And even at marked crosswalks, yielding rates are pathetic. Like um, a lot of studies show it like around 15%, which is not yielding to pedestrians is a much more dangerous than trying to cross a road that, you know, we, as, as, in some cases, what we've asked pedestrians to do is just totally unreasonable. Like, um, you know, if, if if crosswalks are a third of a mile apart, it's it's totally unreasonable to ask a 70-year-old pedestrian to do a two-third of a mile detour to cross at a crosswalk, right? They're gonna, every, every rational person put in that position is, is gonna jaywalk. Um, so we, and if we can provide, I mean, it would be one thing if we had already provided, you know, safe, comfortable, um, routes for pedestrians, and if driver behavior was relatively well controlled, I think may maybe that's the point where we could start cracking down on pedestrian behavior, but we're so far from that. We're, we're just sort of re-victimizing pedestrians, I think, um, when, we, when we blame them for sort of the poor conditions, the dangerous conditions they're subjected to. You mentioned in your book, uh, was it uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul, where they put 
compliance rate signage to indicate how many drivers were obeying crosswalks, uh, signals, and so forth. And compliance went up as drivers were made aware of that, right? Yeah, there was this really cool experiment where they tried to see what can we do to increase yielding rates um, in the St. Paul area. And yeah, they, they, they went out and they, they had these researchers sort of testing how often drivers were yielding. And it was something like, I think it was something around 20, 25% originally. So what they did was to try and they tried to use these um, psychology, these sort of um, these sort of practices that are used in psychology, uh, one of them is called social norming, and they posted um, on a sign, you know, what the yielding rate had been the last week. And they were able to use that and other measures to really increase yielding substantially, which I, I thought was a really cool example of a really proactive and sort of more just approach to trying to improve pedestrian safety. Some Calvin student journalists did a piece last spring on a nearby very busy uh, street and intersection, and they used the term strodes. But, uh, uh, the, according to the article, streets are about interaction, roads are about getting places, and strodes are the worst of both. Um, but in this article, they explored some potential solutions, and I learned from that that narrower roads slow down cars, that, and that may explain why pedestrian safety is higher in a lot of European cities where the roads are just older and narrower, right? Um, tree, li tree lining the roads with trees somehow slows people down. I find that fascinating. Uh, maybe they're stopping to look at the beauty. Um, you mentioned narrow lanes, lower speed limits, and so forth. Um, but this article also mentioned that part of the problem on our local street, 28th Street for, the, for local viewers, uh, is that it's partially controlled locally and partially state controlled. So, so the infrastructure problems here are huge. Uh, I, I want to ask you, you mentioned a lack of respect for local knowledge. I'm thinking about our engineering students who will someday be designing roads. If you could design a course for them to take in understanding the human factors involved in road, road design, what, what would your syllabus look like? What would you like them to realize? Yeah, I think the engineering profession has evolved really quickly, but it's still, uh, there was a lot of sort of problematic ideas. I mean, the, there, it's really a little bit about social science, I think. Um, and it, we've tried to reduce these to like questions about pavement grade and um, there's a lot of credentialism. Uh, around it. So I, I think that's changed a little bit as a result of some pressure. But um, th uh, what, there's a guy I talk about in my book that's an engineer and he's a reform minded engineer. And he talks about like, um, it's really interesting. He talks about like, what is the moral duty of engineers? He says all the time, engineers make these trade-offs and it's just part of the norm. So he's not trying to shame individual engineers, I don't think, but they, they make trade-offs that they know will result in people getting killed. Um, all the time. And he says, you know, the engineer, the engineering profession needs to do better. We're not living sort of up to, there's, there's, um, there's sort of a code, there's sort of an ethical code that the engineering profession isn't living up to in some ways and, and is in need of some, some, some fundamental reforms. So I think that's even more urgent now than when I wrote the book, because, um, this is a problem that's really gotten a lot worse. We saw, um, pedestrian death rates rose in the double digits over the last couple of years. We're sort of having, and I think we're having so many competing crises right now in the United States that this isn't getting that kind of attention it would if that weren't the case. But uh, it, our record is, is bad and it, it's, it's bad compared to our international peers, our traffic safety record, and it's getting worse. And um, it's contributing to, um, along with other problems like rising gun violence and the opioid epidemic, to actually decreasing um, life expectancies in the United States compared to other countries. So, um, so I, I would just encourage them to think more broadly. And um, I, I think like this, this is true for anyone in any profession who has any degree of power or authority over the public. There's, you need to um, have a degree of humility about what you know and what you don't know and um, what you can learn from listening to other people.
I like the way you put it in the book that you mentioned, you mentioned in your talk, language, the kinds of language that was used early on to, to discuss traffic fatalities involving pedestrians um, as, as murders, as killings, and so forth, and now they're called accidents. Um, but, but I like the way you put it in the book where you talk about needing to shift blame from focusing on either drivers or pedestrians and focus instead on infrastructure reform. We have to, with, with nuclear power plants, the, the, the example you use, nuclear power plants and the aviation industry, we create structures to ensure safety rather than assuming that the users are, have the final authority in whether things go well or not. Um, right, like, uh, you know, we, in aviation, we don't just say, you know, pilots <laughs> need to be very, I mean, obviously pilots do have a huge responsibility, but there's safeguards there too. Um, we have a backup system and we have a backup system for that in case something breaks down with the pilot, right? We need the same kind of thing in our transportation system because definitely everyone's going to screw up when they're driving. We have, and in, in the United States, we're so reliant on cars. People are, people really don't have any choice about driving. A lot of us end up dri spending a lot of our time driving. It's very boring. It's difficult to always be attentive. Um, but we can we can do a better job, A, with safer vehicles. I mean, I talked a little bit in the presentation about some of the problems with vehicle design, but there's new technologies coming online now. And this is one of the things I talk about in the book too, um, like automatic emergency braking, automatic pedestrian detection, lane keeping that have a lot of potential to sort of reduce injuries and deaths. So there's, there's ex some exciting new sort of technological innovations that can make cars safer. Um, which we haven't fully embraced yet, but I'm hopeful that we're making progress on. Um, but the same kind of things can apply to infrastructure as well. And I think when you bring those two things together, that's when it becomes really powerful. And when we can start talking seriously about uh, in the long term about either eliminating traffic deaths or reducing them by many um, many factors, like they have in a lot of our peer nations in Europe. Like yeah, um, in the European Union, for example, um, beginning this year, cars are going to be required to be speed limited. So they, they use something called intelligent speed assistance, and it means that cars basically can't speed. They know what the speed limit is in a certain area, and they're automatically limited to the speed limit. That is has the potential, like, potentially that could save 10,000 lives a year in the United States, and that might even be conservative. So that, that technology is ready to go, and our, our peer nations are adopting it, and we're just not. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities that go beyond sort of finger wagging and, and blaming individuals that could have a huge impact that we've sort of passed on and passed the buck for. Um, you mentioned that more people are driving big vehicles. I, I remember as a child, everybody drove just a huge boat. And then when gas prices went way up, we were all driving tiny little vehicles. And ironically, in my memory, the big vehicles came back because they felt safer for drivers. Every dad I knew wanted his kid to drive a big old clunker because it would, it would keep the kid safe. It would be like a tank. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you see a potential as, as gas prices are astronomical, um, will we start driving slower vehicles or smaller vehicles yeah. again? Yeah, I am really curious about that. I'm really curious about that. Um, I would love to see that happen a little bit. I, I would love to see that happen. Um, and you know, really there wasn't, a, people will say, oh, people will sort of blame consumers for this shift towards SUVs. And I do think consumers definitely uh, contributed. I mean, there's definitely like an appetite for SUVs over sedans, but partly it was driven by the auto companies because the auto companies make big profits. Um, they were able to just charge a lot more for SUVs than they are for sedans. So like, for example, I talk about in the book, um, a, a Chevy Silverado, like Chevy, um, according to, um, these auto um, auto publications I read was making seventeen thousand dollars in profit, just in profit on every silver Silverado they sold. It's like insane profit margin compared to some of the more efficient vehicles, like um, their Chevy Bolt. 
they were only making $1,500 in profit on. So the auto companies were very motivated to move people out of small cars and into big cars. And again, it has to do with sort of what consumers uh, are willing to pay. It has to do with sort of we have some perverse regulations. I think all three of those, I mean, consumers, regulators, and auto companies are all sort of responsible in different ways for that shift. Um, so will we, I, I actually, I, I'm not sure. I, I am hopeful at minimum that we'll see more of a shift to electric vehicles. Um, I think that that's sort of apparent. Whether wh whether we'll see vehicles get smaller, I'm not sure. But um, another good thing, and it's something I've been working on a little bit in my business, is um, as a result of the infrastructure bill, um, for the first time, there was um, some language um, put in the infrastructure bill that said um, vehicles need to be rated for pedestrian safety. So in the past, we've never done any vehicle regulations or even rated vehicles on the impacts to pedestrians. Um, and now they'll, they're going to get a five-star rating. You know how we do the five-star ratings. For the first time, it will incorporate impacts to pedestrians and cyclists as a result of this. In addition, they're going to require um, rating them for certain technologies like ped automatic pedestrian te detection. So there's been a little regulatory progress lately that I'm really excited about. That's great. Angie, thank you for your time with us today. Thank you for your book and for all your work. Viewers, thank you for watching the January series on this hot July day. I'm Karen Salpi. We'll see you next time.